would speak to us today and uh, use what he's been dealing with me about and uh, that we would just draw near to him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy in our lives. And Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon us and that you would guide us and strengthen us and lead us today. Lord, I ask for your anointing. I ask that it would break everything that would tie your people back. And Lord, that you would release us into the fullness of ministry and life and love in the precious and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Why don't you turn around, greet somebody, say hello, and you may be seated. It's good to see some of the married couples saying hello to each other for the first time this morning, too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to turn your attention to the book of Ephesians. It is probably one of my favorite letters that Paul writes, if not the favorite letter that Paul writes. And um, for me, it has been a center of how I think and try to minister, uh, especially Ephesians chapter 4. Um, it really, it really just kind of, when I try to go back to a basic, when I try to go back to a, a, a cornerstone, if you will, or a foundational thought, Ephesians really just sticks in my mind. It is a beautiful letter. It's, it's not really long. It does happen to be what's in the Bible quizzing material this year that they have to memorize the entire book plus three or four more. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting, but... I will say that there is a, it just kind of runs around, you, you ever just have like those ongoing conversations with God, and, and it's like this ongoing like verse that you're constantly just gnawing at you, and, and it goes away, but then it comes back, and then it goes away, and it comes, but it's always there kind of working in the back of your mind, thinking this is, this is a fundamental key piece of how I live for the Lord. You, you, do you have those? You know what I'm talking about? There's like these places, I mean, you know, we've got, we've got, We've got like John 1 down and we've got, uh, you know, Acts 238 settled. And, and, and then it's like there's other places where it becomes real practical living. OK, and, and I'm not saying that Acts 238 isn't practical. And I believe that Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh is extremely practical because without that, there's no salvation. Right. So there, that those are key. So don't think I'm throwing that away. But there are some passages that really just kind of. They chew at me. And so, <clears throat> I mean, I could do the whole book of Ephesians today, but I want to kind of um, turn our attention to some of the practical things. And so if you pay attention to how Paul writes, typically he starts out with, hey, you guys are great. I'm praying for you. I think you're wonderful. And then he goes into this high theology of Jesus, what they call high Christology in, in the in the in the nerd places that I go. Um, but <clears throat> so he really talks about who Jesus is for a long period of time in his letters. But then he, he goes from theology to like how Jesus affects your salvation to how it's important then how you live it. OK, because if you have a belief system that you don't live, then you don't have a belief system. You have a theory. OK, I have a lot of theories, but they don't affect how I live. You know, uh, they're just thoughts that I have. But when I really genuinely believe something, then it becomes part of my everyday life. Or I integrate it that way. Right. And so <clears throat> here here is here is something that I'm just kind of I'm giving you a lot of preface to. So Ephesus is that city in the book of Acts that was infamous uh, for witchcraft and um, and in a temple to Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And uh, it was when Paul went there to preach that, if you remember, they, they chanted for hours, great is the goddess Diana, or Artemis, depending on which, if you were Greek or Roman, how you worshipped her. 
And, and it, was, it was a place where they brought out millions of dollars of books, of witchcraft books. So this, this was a very spiritual place. All right? And that's probably why in chapter 6 he talks about the armor of Christ and that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we pull down strongholds and there's spiritual things that are going on. But in the middle of this book, and I'm going to read a verse, but then I'm going to back up if that's okay. Uh, Paul tries to make it very, very practical. And I want to turn your attention, and if you've been around here, it's not an unfamiliar passage, but Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10, reading from the New Living Translation. And here we go. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. And if you do your Bible reading, sometimes you just blast through that, but something stuck out to me years ago, probably, well, it was about 2009 when this really just kind of slapped me in the face. And I know because I started writing on it then. I started doing some devotions on it. I started doing some sermons on it. And I, ever since then, it's progressed and it's progressed and it's grown. Because you'll find a phrase similar to this in almost every one of Paul's letters. And what he's calling people to is a life that pleases Jesus. Now, it sounds so simple. But when you consider just the phrase here, carefully, don't just run into stuff or run out of stuff because other people are. Determine if it pleases Jesus or not. And how can you determine if something pleases someone if you don't know them? So it is built upon a real lived relationship with the Lord. And to be just basic, it is, it's so simple, but it is so difficult to, to capture most times, is that to have a real relationship with God, the little Sunday school song really does work. Read your Bible and pray every day. I find that so many people make decisions without prayer or consulting the Word of God. And then they wonder, and I, I won't throw it on anybody else, I wonder why it didn't work. Anybody else ever been there? Know what I'm talking about? And you're just like, well, I think I can do this on my own. And we didn't stop and go, Lord, does this make sense to you? And when you put everything in your life through this one verse, I know it's, it's like a filter for me. It's become that. Like it's a filter. Will this please the Lord? Will this word I use, will this action, will this thought, will this show, will this behavior, will this clothing, will this place I'm going. And I'm not asking God to like police my life. What I'm looking at is how can I draw near to the Lord? And it's not a works-based thing. So, so, so don't, don't think I'm saying, well, you've got to do all these things. I'm talking about a real relationship with the Lord where you go, hey, you like this? Do you like what I make? Do you, know, you know, anybody tried something new when you're cooking one time? You said it before your spouse, say, hey, do you like this? And they're like, mm, okay, we're not going to make that again. Good to know, right? You know, and, 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 and so I can, I mean, I've told this joke before, but when uh, Carol and I uh, were dating and we were engaged, I I went to her house one morning early, and her mother wanted to make me breakfast. And I was like, fantastic. This is great. You know, she's from the south, uh, southern Ohio, and so she can probably make biscuits and gravy like my mom, and this is going to be great. And she's like, I'm going to make you some eggs. I'm like, cool, scrambled eggs, fantastic, whatever, bacon, good, go. Well, Gloria at the time was having eye issues, and she needed to have some, like, glaucoma or something removed. And she had a couple of canisters on top of the, the stove. And uh, this is one of my favorite memories of her, I think. Um, <clears throat> and she's cooking these eggs. And 
she reaches over and grabs the containers, puts it on there like normal, and, and, and she ties them up and brings them over to me and sets them down on the plate. And, and I'm eating them, and I'm like two bites in. I'm like, mm. I don't know if this is a game. I don't know if she's testing me. I don't know what this is. But I have never ate eggs that taste like a garlic clove. And, 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 and I, to her credit, she, she's a really, she was a really good cook, okay? She really made a lot of good food. But that day, she didn't focus well on, on it was salt or it was garlic salt. And she grabbed the, and she just doused it in there. And man, she said, how you doing? I'm doing good. Doing good. Thank you so much for breakfast, you know. I'm like, Carol, don't you ever make me eggs like your mama does. You know? <laughs> she says, what are you talking about, Steve? And she's like, no. Oh, she must have not seen it. You know, it, it, when you have those moments in your life, I, I want to make sure I'm making a good impression on my soon-to-be mother-in-law, right? Do things to... And, and when you have a relationship with people, when you have a relationship with the Lord, it should not be this, does this make you happy, God? I'm not living in fear. I'm living in grace. Because by the time you get to chapter 5, if you haven't found the grace of God in this book, then you've missed it. You have completely missed chapter 2. Chapter 2, I mean, and not that Paul wrote it in chapter, but, but when he was writing the letter, before he got to living, he got to why you get to live. And in, in, in what we call chapter 2, says you, you were once dead because of your disobedience. You, you were you were in your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. All of us were like, sin, woohoo! We just live in it. It was like just the air we breathed. It's, we didn't, we lived in the dark. We thought everything was dark. We're just like, whoa, everybody's blind. We're just running into walls everywhere we go. Why didn't this work? You know, drugs don't work. Let's take more. You know, sex didn't work. Let's get more. Money didn't work, let's get more. Because apparently something has to work, but we're just all in the dark, right? And, and so we're just like, well, maybe that's what the, I hear somebody over there doing this. Let's we'll figure it out. No, it's the blind leading the blind. We all fall in the ditch. And, and he's saying, listen, you were dead. You were dead just like the rest of the world. And you were obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He's like, oh, I, didn't, I, I was never a slave. You were a slave to sin. I mean, I, I mean, you were addicted. That is a form of slavery. You were bound by bitterness and hate. Oh, I wasn't bound. Really? Because like all of your, if you go back and listen to yourself, right? that doesn't sound free to me. You had to get wasted to have a good time. Anybody, I'm not trying to bring up your past, but anybody remember those days? I'm not a slave. I'm going to go to church. They got a bunch of rules. My God. Blah, 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 blah. You're like, no, I'm free. I had a guy in Grand Rapids one time. He's like, man, tithing, this is just rough. Like, really? Yeah, it's rough. And he, he made, you know, I'm just going to guess. He made like $800 a week or whatever. I mean, it was fine. I mean, I'm just not picking on him. It's just, I think that was his wage or whatever. He's like, tithing is just rough. I said, really? So how much did you spend on a Friday night at the bar? Oh, man, I'd spend $350, $500, no problem. Who's a slave to who? One's a curse that drains you, and you wake up and can't pay your bills on Monday. But then you come to the Lord, and you say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with this. And the next thing you know, little is much when God is in it. Like, the ratio to me... And I'm just throwing that out there as an example. We have all this bondage that we didn't realize we have, and the Bible's like, you were bound, you were sinful. And, and, and you, he is the spirit that works in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all, I love how Paul says this, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. As a matter of fact, we were by our very nature subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. We were under rightful anger of a holy God. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much 
that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. When you realize God loved you, this is hard for people to receive sometimes. Now, and I'll, I'll be very real. Like All this is just boiling around in my head. Is this all right? I didn't know I was teaching this morning, so I'm just kind of giving you what's all the little thoughts that are running around, the gerbils that are fighting in my head right now. Um, <clears throat> and so I have, I have a difficulty receiving, personally. It, it's hard for me to receive things, okay? Especially nice things. It's, it's like, and, I, and I've been digging down deep. Like, there's a core belief of something that, that, that is not true. Okay, and, and I have found that if you have a hard time receiving, you probably have a hard time giving. You'll give, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't weigh the same. And I can remember uh, sitting in church on an Easter Sunday, and um, this gentleman approached me, and he had a watch that, that I occasionally wear. And he... Um, came to me, and he gave me this very, very nice watch, very, I mean, out of nowhere. And I'm not asking for anything, so don't, th please don't misunderstand this. This is not that. Just, okay? And I'm standing there, I'm, I'm, and my nature is like, no, you keep that, brother. That's really nice. It's just, I'm always. And the Lord's like, you need to receive this. What? I didn't earn it. I didn't, and some of us are like that when it comes to God's grace. I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. And so when we approach living for Jesus, carefully determine what pleases the Lord, we approach it with, I'm going to earn God's favor. But that's not you were favored when you were dead in your sins. You were loved when you were lost. When you were sleeping around, drunk and high as a kite, bitter as all could be, abusive, swearing, nasty, mean, dark, hiding in a hole, depressed, abandoned, whatever label you have from yesterday, Jesus, I love you right there. Matter of fact, I love you so much, I'm going to give you the greatest gift that could ever be given to anyone. I'm going to shed my blood for you. I, I, no, you know, I can't, I can't. And I've noticed that people kind of fight with God. And, and I think at times I have too. I can't receive that. I can't, I can't, I can't do what you asked me to do because I'm not worth, I didn't earn it. It's like the, the, the calling I give you isn't based upon what you do. The love I give you is not based upon how you perform. I just, I mean, when was the last time you and I really just considered what Ephesians is saying? It, it is, well, let me, let me say it like this. Um, he raises from the dead. He raised, as the Bible says in verse 6, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages examples of his incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united. You know what God wants to do? And, and Brother Jason, I'm, I'm not just, just going to pick on you because I think you can handle it. Um, but God's going, hey, look, I loved him. I gave him grace. Mm -hmm, that's how good I am. So I can do it for you. Right? And if I did it for Steve, I can do it. God's using your life and the mess you were in to go, look how good I am. Because I can show you not how good we are. Look at me, I've got all these badges of I got straight A's. I make this amount of money. I've had perfect attendance. The Lord's like, pfft. 
carefully determine what pleases the Lord comes out of the gift of grace. Am I helping anybody here today? It's not about my, it's, I'm going to do this so that, no. Grace empowers me to live differently. Grace is a gift that God wants to use. He says, we were saved by his grace when you believed. And I love this verse eight. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Gift. A gift. And I know this is basic Christianity 101, right? But but when's the last time you realized God is in the big gift giving business? Like he is the best gift giver there is. And probably you and I have not unwrapped grace enough. Maybe just enough to go, oh, thank you. You ever have one of those gifts? Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm good. I'm. And I can re gift it. You need grace, and you need grace, and, and I'm fighting with it the whole time going, I can do this on my own. Show grace to everyone else, but receiving it for me? Maybe you don't have those problems. Maybe you all are living in the fullness of God's grace, and it's just your pastor who needs prayer at times. But I have a feeling that most of us fall into this. That we are... Insanely dependent because we're like crying out in terror or we are insanely rebellious and think we can do it on our own. And none of it is where we're just like, Lord, I just trust you. Will you help me walk? Can I just can you just talk to me and tell me what how much you love me? And 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 man, because like if I could just hear your voice, tell me how much you love me, I, I, I'd walk out of the dark for that, man. I'd, I'd walk out of the dark for that. And then, so Paul continues and says this. This is not only are you saved by God's grace when you believed, you can't take credit for it. Verse 9, salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. Well, God had to save me because look at how cool I am. I mean, look how much influence I have. Look how much I bring to the table. Really? He made the table and he made you. What you bringing? And then you got invited. <laughs> right? So it's not like it ain't your table. It ain't even your house. But he's saying, come on in. And, and, and so, like, uh, so why is it? Can, can I just I'm gonna ask a question here? Why is it after we believe that to speak in tongues and receive the Holy Ghost that we get up and think, okay, now I can do this on my own? Has anybody ever fallen into that trap? And we become performance-based instead of relationally growing with God? cool thing about Jesus is he doesn't get exhausted with my failures I heard uh, so there's a couple Christian bands that I like I don't agree with everything they sing but listen just whatever but most by and large actually their light, latest song I really appreciate because it's it's like the most oneness song I've heard come out in a long time um, but Matt Powell is is a is a writer and a singer for a band called third day it's a little bit like a little country rock Christian band, so if that's not your flavor, pray for me. <clears throat> All right? And, and he was speaking one time, and I heard him on this. He says, grace really wasn't amazing until the third or fourth time I needed it. And then I realized how much I needed grace every day, and then it became really amazing. Because, you know, pretty much all of us can forgive somebody once, maybe, right? Maybe some of us can't, but most of the time. But like 10 times? 70 times 7 in a day? And Jesus didn't go, I'm done with you. He's going, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Let me carry you now. Grace. It's not something you can boast about. 
And if you can't boast about the salvation of God, then maybe we shouldn't boast about the life that we live later in God. And if we have any boast, Paul says, let it be in the cross. It was Jesus who did this for me. It was Jesus who set me free. And I love verse 10. He says, for we are God's masterpiece. When was the last time you looked in the mirror? (laughs) And you thought. You looked at that and you're like, man. This is better than Da Vinci. I know most of us are like, that's Salvador Dali. <laughs> if you don't know who that is, later you can look it up. You're like, nah. <laughs> that's more Picasso, Pastor. Uh, no, like you're, you're, you're Michelangelo. He saw the angel in the marble. You are, you are beautiful. You are God's masterpiece. That He is using your life and your story to demonstrate His abundant mercy to the world. And He is using you as, as a, not, not using you in a negative way, but He loves you so much that He's like, look, this is my kid. I mean, How many of us were like, look, my kid got straight A's, but we ain't going to talk about how they mouthed off to you this morning on the way here. We're not going to talk about how they, you know, like, you know, broke your family heirloom. This is my boy and he can play the, and we just, and he hit, and I, right? We're not, and masterpiece, right? And that's, that's what we do. We put our, and the Lord's going, masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It is not a lie to look at people and go, God has a plan for you. As a matter of fact, he's got a good plan for you. He has had a plan for you for a very long time. It's a plan called grace not performance. And what if we lived our life like that? What if we considered for a moment, Lord, I, I want to be careful that I'm living in grace. What pleases God? Scripture tells us what pleases God. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him for without faith it is impossible to please God look what I did impossible I just blanket trust God that's tough because I don't know that any of us blanket trust anybody Oh, we've lived with them and we love them and we've walked with them and, and we know them and them, but we have a limit. Am I wrong? But the Lord's saying, just trust me. Do the giant trust fall, the greatest trust fall of your life. Trust me. Trust me that my grace is big enough. Trust me that my mercy is long enough. Trust me that I will not let you be put to shame. Trust me that I will never leave you, never forsake you. Trust, if you will just trust. And that's what he says, when you believed, when you trusted God, he's so rich in mercy. So rich in mercy. And Paul will start talking about unity next. That because of this, and if you look around the room, there's people that you would never, ever encounter in your life that are sitting around here because of the grace of God. I would not know most of you, if any of you, if it was not for the grace of God. I call you my family because in many ways we're closer than some other relationships I have because of the grace of God. Amen? And and so... So Paul begins to talk about unity. He talks about p- praying for growth and, and <clears throat> asking God to help people see. I mean, if you jump to chapter 3 and verse 17, 
He's in the middle of a prayer. He says, Christ will make his home in your heart so that as you trust in him. So as you trust God, he builds in you. And maybe that's why Paul says it in Romans, from faith to faith. It's, it's not just faith. I trusted God with my salvation. He came through. I trusted him in baptism, and he came through. I trusted him when I asked for the spirit, I, the promise of the Holy Ghost, and, and, and he gave it to me. I trust God to teach me. I'm trusting, you know, you ever bought a house? Anybody ever bought a house that was previously owned? You didn't just build it, like you, you had to move. Anybody find stuff in the house you had to clean out? We started renting a house in Grand Rapids, and uh, when we did, <coughs> they had this really high cabinet, and uh, <coughs> in, in the shed they had this really nice Weber grill. I was like, thank you for leaving that. <laughs> and I contacted the homeowner. I said, what do you want me to do with this grill? Oh, you can keep it. I was like, thank you. And, and we're going through, I mean, it's a really nice Weber grill. I love that. I used that thing till it about melted. Um, <coughs> but then I go in the kitchen, and, and everything's clean, and I'm getting ready to put, like, you know, the, the holiday dishes up in the top or whatever which you don't hardly ever use. I open it up, and it's just full of liquor. And I'm talking the hard stuff. I was like, um, hmm, got to get rid of that. Like, and probably some really expensive stuff if I would have known what it was worth, but not that I could go sell it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Bringing in an offering for the Lord, hallelujah. <coughs> Funny joke, we had a guy in Grand Rapids that, we do not endorse gambling with none of this, but he went out and gambled one night. Pastor, I was gambling. I said, oh, man. He said, I won. I'm like, well, that, that's good. And I was just kind of joking. Pay your tithes. Well, I did. I bought the church a horse trough for a baptistry. I was like, well, we'll take the baptistry, but don't go gambling again. God, help us, you know. Uh, <laughs> Pastors, we, got, we get some really crazy things that happen to us. We're like, I don't know how to navigate this. Lord, does this please you? <laughs> Forgive me if I did it wrong. You know, whatever. So, so, and, and, uh, The longer you walk with God, he's moving into a house that was previously occupied. And the cool thing is, is he doesn't just dump it all at once because I couldn't handle it. Right? Couldn't handle it. Well, today we're going to handle this. This closet, you left some stuff in there. I'd like to move some stuff in, but that's got to go. Notice he didn't go, I'm leaving. Well, that's just too scary for me. No, he knew what he was getting when he bought the house. He didn't need somebody else to come in and do an inspection. He knew the foundation was faulty. He knew that the windows weren't square. He kn- now he's building a home as you trust him. He cl- and he continues and says, he says, your roots in verse 17 will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. What are your roots growing into? His love for you. My strength is rooted in the love of God. My fruit that is produced is because of where my roots are. We have a little apple tree in our front yard that we planted. Um, I, think, I, think, I think you planted it, brother. And for years that thing would not do anything. Like, we've been here, we've had that house eight years now, coming up on eight years. And that thing would not grow, it, like, it had like two apples one year. I was like, well, that's about what it is. And then last year, I decided, you know, I'm going to try something. I went and got these big fertilizer uh, stakes and just shoved them down. That thing made so many apples. Now, they were a little misformed, but they were good. I was like, I'm not sure how they get these things not have lumps and bumps in them, but we'll figure it out next year. Spring. Well, there you go. See, now I've learned something. And, and isn't that how it is in your life with God? Until, until your roots get around something healthy, you are not either you're not producing or you're producing incorrectly. Ah. Check if the fruits ain't right, check the roots. Are you rooted in the love of God? 
or are you rooted in performance? You know, I don't think my little apple tree is out there. I got to make apples for Steve. Ah! It's going, what's in the ground is what you're going to get up here. Mm. He says, and that's why you'll be strong. And may you have the power. Now, this, this, this is so cool, 18. To understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. He wants you to understand it. Verse 19, and may you experience the love of God, the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully or to understand fully. I want you to get a picture of how big God loves you. So when you think you've got the limit, it keeps going. When you think you've figured out how much Jesus loves you, it still keeps going. He says, but I don't want you to just think about it. Because a lot of people, I was talking to a, a guy in my cohort the other day. He's like, hey, we're called the chosen frozen. We're all theologically in our head. I was like, seriously? He says, I want you to know it. But I also want you to experience it. It's one thing to say, Sister Aura, Jesus loves me. It is another thing to experience it. And you only experience it when you believe. Faith opens the door. He says, now, then you will be made complete. People don't complete you. Jobs don't complete you. Things don't complete you. Jesus completes you. You will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. Wow. Love. So we've got the grace of God. We've got Jesus who comes to us. Jesus who loves us. Chapter one. Chapter two, we've got Jesus is the is, is the pays the price for us and it's grace we didn't we didn't earn it on our own he just he just loved us it's some people call it unmerited favor it's favor that you you just you just couldn't earn it's just a love that god gives it's it's almost so impossible for us to imagine that you have to accept it by faith because it's just so not like us most of the time we love people because well we i love you but as long as you i get something out of this Right? There's a mutual relationship, mutually beneficial. What does God get out of this? Right? I look in the mirror and I'm like, you sure you wanted to do that? <clears throat> then he says, all glory to God and mighty power works within us, accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So God is working in us through his love and our faith more than we could ever ask or think. And then you get him to chapter four. Chapter four talks about the ministry. He, in, in chapter four, verse one, he's like, I want you to walk worthy He says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. You've been called by God. And I think for so many years, I looked at that and said, and, and I know I'm coming to a time break here. Is this okay, though? I've come to this and I've looked at it. I go, okay, I got I to gotta, I gotta earn it. No, 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 no. He says I'm holy. He says I'm forgiven. He says, I am loved. He says, I'm invited. The word calling there is kalesis. It's a Greek, Greek word that is an invitation to all of us who have ever felt left out. Last one picked. And for whatever reason, forgotten. Her mother, I had a conversation with her the other day. She began to relate to me, and I don't know if I'll get it correctly. She, she, she had a dream. In her dream, she was at this massive table with hundreds of thousands of people in every direction that she couldn't see. And the table was just filled with food. And she says, Stephen, it seemed to me like I was in heaven for a moment. And she says, I was sitting there thinking to myself, there's so many people who will never have time for me. 
And she said, and suddenly I felt this hand on my shoulder. And I turned around. She said, I didn't see him, but I knew what was in front of me was Jesus. And, and he was like, I have time for you. Whew. How would you live knowing you've been invited to that table? How would you live knowing, carefully determine what pleases what to carefully determine what pleases the Lord becomes like <laughs> I get to go to that table. I get to be a part of that bride. I get to be a part of what the Lord loves because He loved me when I was unlovable. There's a difference. I'm not trying to earn it. So I'm trying to just. So the Jews do this with their kids and, and some Muslims when they have their children, they look at them and they go, you're going to grow up to be a doctor. That's not what they say. They look at them and say, you are a doctor. This is what doctors do. It's not a maybe identity. It's a identity. You are holy. Because I say so. You are forgiven because I said so. You are. Walk worthy of that. Walk in that. So you approach school different when you know you're a doctor. Mom and dad see something in me that nobody else sees in me. I'm going to be a doctor. I mean, I'm not going to be a doctor. I am a doctor. They see me as a doctor. I'm going to walk like a doctor. I'm going to talk like a doctor. In our culture, we, no, we need to let kids fully express who they are. They don't even know what pocket lint is. They'll eat it or a, a raspberry. Like, they just, Whatever. I want them to, they can express themselves with me giving them identity. You're my kid. I don't care if you try to identify as somebody else's kid. You're mine. And I will find you and I will love you. But I will also guide you and direct you. And run as far as you want. I will find you as long as I'm breathing. And I'll get everybody else to help me too. You see what I'm saying? We don't have to, we don't have to, uh, you're just, you're enforcing. No, I'm giving opportunity. That's a completely different sermon, thought. But like I said, these are all the ramblings of your pastor in his head during the week. So this is what happens when I don't have a whole lot of notes. Just bear with me here. Um, <clears throat> So Paul is asking them, and then he talks about the ministry gifts to the church. He talks that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all, living in you all, chapter 4. And then he talks about the gifts that God gives to empower the church, that the ministry roles, the role that I play as a pastor is to equip you and to teach you. And one of the greatest things I think that Paul teaches and that we can equip one another with is grace. You know, if, if you really just understood how much you are loved by God, maybe some of the stress... And fear. I, I, I have a, a and I got to be careful how I say it all because it's, broad, it's broadcast, but there are times in my life that I have an overabundance of anxiety, of fear. Oh, I got to do this. I got to do this. Or, and that's not how the Lord works. He sees me whether I'm doing it for performance or not. He still loves me. Am I helping anybody or is this just like out there? So <clears throat> chapter four, he goes on and he says, listen, and, and, and this is where I kind of want to get to in the next five minutes. And I'm going to try to wind it down. In, in chapter four, he starts talking about, you know, don't live like the Gentiles in, in, uh, in verse 17. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander from the life. We've talked about that. They've closed their minds and hardened their hearts have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure, eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that's not what you've learned about. Christ.
Christ, since you have heard about Jesus and learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. OK, so where where does this start? It starts with God loving us and then changing how we think. And then how we approach life. I have met a lot of people who live for God very angrily. I got to go to church again. I have to live. I can't cuss. You can't? I, I, seriously, there, I've encountered all kinds of crazy. I'm not allowed to do that. Like, I think your attitude is wrong here. Let's get your attitude right first. Let's... I'm not giving people like <laughs> pastor said we could cuss. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, he's, he says, listen, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature. In a lot of areas, it's like he uses the analogy of clothing. Take this off, put this on. Blind Bartimaeus got it right. He took off his beggar's garment as he was coming to Jesus because he knew when I leave here, I'm not going to be the same. He changes you because he loves you. He sets you free, gives you a fresh identity because he loves you. And, and so he goes through this and says, put on, put on your new nature. Uh, tr created to be like God and, and stop telling lies. Tell your neighbor the truth and we're all parts of the same body. And, and don't let sin, you know, don't let sin, don't and don't sin by letting anger control you and don't let the sun go down while you're angry. And anger gives a foothold to the devil. We can go there. And if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others who need. Oh, here we go. Verse 29. And don't use foul or abusive language. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got there. The battery's still on. And, and let everything you say be good and helpful so that all your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. But it starts with the love of God working in us. It is hard to love other people. When you don't allow God to love you and eventually you love you even and in, in, in this world, th this word can be twisted that you actually love yourself because of what God loves about you. Not because, oh, look at me, I'm so wonderful. The world has a different idea of that. And it changes you. Don't bring sorrow to the, God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own. Guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, and all types of evil behavior. Instead, and this is where I want to get to as much as I can today because I think it's throughout the rest of the book. Be kind to each other. We have a word in English that I think is just a misnomer. We use the word be nice. What's nice? I mean being kind. Be kind. And, and tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. I have met people who and do not take and twist this the wrong way. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and says, you tithe on, on uh, what is it, your spices, and you and, but, but you bind people with these heavy weights. And some people say, so you don't have to tithe. That's not what he was saying, because he tells them, good, that's, that's a good thing that you do. There are some people who can look right but their hearts are so hard they have no mercy 
no compassion, no kindness. Now, will it change how you, will the Spirit of God change how you dress? Yeah, you'll identify as a child of the King. Okay? Well, we can get there some other time. But, what pleases God, and this is my argument right here, forgiving one another, loving one another, pleases God. And if there is anything in my adult life that I have learned, I need the Holy Ghost to help me to forgive people. When you're a kid, it, it seems like, well, I need the Holy Ghost to help me not, you know, run into the world and, you know, sin. Yeah, you do. But the older I get, I need the Holy Ghost to help me forgive people and love people. And if I could end this on this one thought, it really bothers me that we cannot get along in church and we think we're all going to make it to heaven. It bothers me that we have this idea that I can run and, and I, can, I can have a, a mm. I can get mad at so and so. I can just go somewhere else because I'm mad at them, not, not because of other reasons. Just hear me out here. Preachers can get upset with each other and, 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 and not get along, and then we think we're all going to make it. Families can get divided and, and, you know, I'm praying and I'm praying and you're spiritual and I'm spiritual. Really? Where's, where's the love and the forgiveness and the reconciliation? Where's the, I'm going to work this out. We're going to be like somebody. And, and, and one of my boys came to me the other day, and I preached it years ago, but when he said it, it just kind of like, Pfft. he goes, to really forgive somebody, something has to die. Because to forgive me, Jesus had to be crucified. I was like, yeah, boy, um, dad's going to go pray now. Um, <clears throat> young faith right there. You'll grow out of that. No, I hope he never does. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, dude, man, when, you, when, you, when they start preaching back at you, you're like, yes, Lord. See, that's that. Look at him. He's great. <laughs> I can tell you, he mouthed off to me later. But <laughs> forgive you right now. Hallelujah. And, 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 but here's the thing. It is so hard. And, and I know what I'm saying isn't a fun, let's run to Jesus. And I'm not asking anybody to put themselves in an abusive situation or a hurtful way. You, you have to have clear, healthy boundaries. There are toxic relationships that... that but here's the problem that I have. There are toxic relationships that front themselves as being Christ-like, and they're not. Does that make sense? And they're like, look, at you're not. God help me if I'm not. And so a few years ago, I began to pray, Lord, teach me how to love people. And you want to know where it ended or where it's taken me? How much he loves me. Am I saying it's easy? Am I saying it can? No. And reconciliation can be very difficult. It takes work. But to wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Mm. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. I'm not just sorry, God, that I'm angry at that person. I want to forgive them. And one of the greatest gifts you can ever give yourself is forgiving other people. I just challenge you. I just challenge you. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. I do believe that God is just. I do believe that God is willing to work with. But I've just, I've just had this issue lately where 
I see things and it's like, am I really acting like Jesus? Am I, and how do you know how Jesus acts? How does he act towards you? Does he correct me? Absolutely. Does he redirect me? Absolutely. Are there times that he's really sharp with me? Sure. But that's because he loves me. And whom the Lord loves, he corrects. What pleases Jesus? Now, we had some fun this morning, and I pray that you take that as, as what it is. But I just I want to challenge you this morning. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord, and I think it starts in our head and our heart. How we think and how we have an attitude. So, would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I pray that today, through your word, we recognize the abundant mercy and grace that you have given us. And Lord, I pray that I've steered no one wrong in this, and I ask God that you would minister in this house and help us to forgive one another as you have forgiven us. And let the fruit of the Spirit grow from the root being grounded in your love. Let there be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and temperance, which there is no law against. Because we're grounded in how much you love us. 